Okay. So, for our last panel of the night, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can actually hurt me. Our first panelist, Stephen Bonnell, or as many people may know him online as Destiny. Destiny is a popular Twitch streamer and a YouTuber. Yiannopoulos is an award-winning journalist, a New York Times selling best author, a comedian, an accomplished entrepreneur, and to the annoyance of many of his enemies, an exceedingly happy person. <laughs> he is one of the most sought-after speakers anywhere, invited by foreign governments, wealthy individuals, and even the occasional private company to share his unique blend of laughter and war. His book, Dangerous, sold over 200,000 copies, despite never being reviewed in any major publication. He said hello to me in the hotel lobby, and I didn't realize. I said hello to him, and he just walked right away. No, no, I didn't. Now I, I just saw him. I was like, oh fuck. Um, no, I just I didn't realize because he was very polite. So I was like, hey, my, I was like, hey, like, and then I just went back to my visit. You have different hair on the internet. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I apologize. I was very rude to you at the hotel. It's, it's, it's okay. I'm just the intro guy. It's it's okay. It's okay. I know, but you've got this aura of authority, and you've got these suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> these suspenders, they command explanations. <laughs> and our moderator, Brandon Strzok, he's the founder of the Walk Away Campaign. He's a former liberal and former Democratic Party supporter who has very publicly walked away from the political left and created a social movement encouraging others to do the same. Brandon frequently provides commentary on Fox News as a reoccurring guest on Justice with Janine per Perrero. Fox and Friends, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, and many other television media outlets. <laughs> no, I don't like the masks. Shady bitch. No, 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 no. You know, you know, you know I, I, I'm not indifferent to you, but um, I, the, the social distancing is wonderful. But it's how I wish everybody was all the time, because I can't stand anyone. Uh, the masks are a nightmare, but social distancing is fabulous. I never wanted to go away. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? <laughs> all right. Hi. Uh, my name is Brandon Strzok. The name of our panel this evening is Six and Stones May Break My Bones, but can words actually hurt me? You know, I was actually known for a brief time in 2018 as the poor man's Milo Yiannopoulos, so it's really a pleasure to be sitting here. No, that was Chadwick Moore. <laughs> you were the poor man's Milo Yiannopoulos in 2019. It was, still prefer <laughs> it was still preferable to the alternative, which was gay Candace Owens. I actually prefer that. <laughs> All right. So guys, I want to start off tonight uh, by kind of just asking you to define for, for me and for the audience in your own terms uh, just very simple uh, question. I'm gonna start with no. I'm gonna start with Milo. Uh, Milo, define hate speech. And before you answer, the reason why I'm asking this question, which is very basic, is that you are actually a very interesting character. I feel like I did a little research on you, and it's hard to actually pin down. You're not a typical. Do you consider yourself a liberal? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, but you don't have particularly liberal views on speech, free speech, hate speech. It depends. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. Okay, great. So, Milo, uh, can you define hate speech? No, because nobody can. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Love it. Destiny, same question. So, hate speech, uh, we can look at it at three different levels, basically, right? We've got legal definitions, we've got corporation definitions, and then we've got kind of our own personal, moral, ethical definitions. Um, it really depends on the type of conversation we want to have. Like on the legal level, um, well in America, I don't believe there's any definition of hate speech on the legal level. On the corporation level, usually hateful conduct is conduct that discriminates against like age, ethnicity, religion, whatever Twitter is, Facebook, uh, TOS says. And then on our own personal level, um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, I guess. So for the purpose of tonight's uh, conversation, I think we're gonna focus mostly on things like social justice, cancel culture, social media, uh, how hate speech would apply to these kind of things. And so I didn't expect your definitions to be that brief, so we'll get right into the next segment, which is, can we compare emotional pain with physical pain? 
And so to, say, to, to get this kicked off, psychologists from Friedrich Schiller University in Germany had 16 subjects read pain-related words while imagining situations that corresponded to each word. During the experiments, participants had their brains scanned with functional magnetic resonance imaging. And the, the result was that Dr. Thomas Weiss told Live Science there was an activation in the pain matrix of the brain to subjects who heard pain words. So if we accept that there are reactions in the brain resulting from harmful words that are very similar to those when people feel physical pain, should we separate the two, Milo? Is emotional pain synonymous or, or worthy of discussion in regards to physical pain when it comes to the, being hurt by words? Quite clearly, there are physical reactions observable from words, and it shouldn't surprise us, uh, that shouldn't surprise anyone to hear me say, obviously words can be dangerous, words can be impactful, words can change the world, after all they're proxies for ideas, uh, which is about what we have. The question is, is, can utterances, can something you say out loud affect material reality in a way that t turns them into something a bit like magical spells? Can something that I say have a physical effect on you in a way that seems to reflect in a sense, I guess, I mean, the, the closest thing I can think of prior to this debate popping up in the last 10 years is transubstantiation. And indeed, we're having this debate in the way that we're having it because our understanding of words and action is based in the incarnation. This is the... the linguistic and cultural basis of everything we're talking about is the word made flesh. This is central Catholic doctrine, transubstantiation. Can words become things? Can words affect things? Well, it seems to me that it's quite obvious that they can. You can produce particular reactions in people's brains, synapses, chemicals, and whatnot with words they hear. The two questions, I suppose, are if we agree that magical spells are, 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 exist, one, do they operate independently of whether the subject knows what they're hearing? So if I, if I, can I avara cadabra you, and even if you don't know that spell, can you still be killed by it? And the second thing is, if we, if we are going to allow that these magical spells exist, where in our model do we allow for the soul? We've got the body, we've got the mind, we have our studies, and he knows lots of these, and, and has talked about them online a lot, and he's right about most of what he says. It can have a direct effect. But Descartes, I think, has misled us um, a little bit, and we're missing in this question the soul. And it's the soul that mediates the two. It is the soul uh, that has the power to say, that hurt me, but I'm not going to let it ruin my life. And it seems from the studies that, that I, can, I can tell, uh, it seems as far as I can tell from the studies, rather, that although children's brain chemistry, the white matter, can be changed by really heavily, properly abusive language in the early years, it seems to be that people develop a kind of resilience. And unfortunately, what a lot of these studies seem to be doing is presenting the case for bullying, which I support, because, <laughs> because the purpose of the soul in this uh, in this tripartite dynamic is the mediating layer between the two. This is, this is words create a direct you know, uh, chemical reaction, and then we have a moment where we can decide. Then we have agency. Then we have individual responsibility. It's at that point we can decide, is this going to be what and who I am from now on? Is this going to destroy my life? Am I going to get offended? And so on the understanding of all that, can words create physical reactions? Absolutely. But are words violence in the way that a physical act is? I don't think so. Because if I punch you, it hurts whether you see it happen, whether you're even aware of it happening or not. But verbal abuse, if you like, doesn't function like that. There's something a bit more complicated going on, and it requires our participation. And our participation determines almost entirely what happens at the end of it. I need to turn to Destiny with the same question, but I, one could certainly, I was done. <laughs> one could certainly <laughs> argue that although the effects are different, the results of emotional pain can be much longer lasting and much more scarring 
than the temporary physical pain that somebody experiences from being punched. But I want to ask you, sir, the very same question. Uh, if, if we know, or, or if science is suggesting that uh, the brain can react in a way to uh, emotional pain or, or the, the feelings from words in a way that is similar to experiencing physical pain, is this something that we should be looking at and saying that we should be treating the two as equal? I mean, we have different words for them for different reasons. They're both clearly very different things. Um, I would agree with most of what Milo said, obviously. Verbal words can lead to some impact. Um, and I would actually disagree with the idea that we have to recognize um, or that we have to participate in understanding those words. Uh, for instance, we just listened to a panel for an hour and a half where somebody me tooing you or calling you racist or sexist or homophobic might have a big impact on your job, uh, much the same way that breaking somebody's leg or slashing somebody's tire or something like that could. Um, in terms of, you know, should they be seen as the same? Obviously, they're quite different, but they could have different impacts. So I think it's important when we have a discussion on, like, can words hurt you? Um, what level we're having the discussion at, you know? In a very obvious way, somebody can't say something to me that's going to break my arm, but somebody could say something to the people around me that would inhibit my ability to work. Do I call you Stephen or Justin? Stephen, please. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I you, all have, you all have such funny names. <laughs> so I, did, I, I had a conversation online with a Mr. Jingles. Sorry about that. Like a week ago. <laughs> you know, Mr. Oh, his name is Jingles. And now destiny. Um, it's all very. It's all very. Uh, um, thank you, for Stephen. To be fair, my my, my video game name is Destiny. Your real life last name is Yiannopoulos, which is pretty funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's worse than you think because I, I grew up with my mom's surname. I actually changed it to my dad's name. I chose to be Yiannopoulos. It's even worse than you imagine. <laughs> so, Milo, you began to transition to the next topic, which is uh, do words lead to violence? And not so long ago, decriers of hate speech would often point to the connection between hateful speech leading to physical harm, citing that hate speech incites violence. Now, the, the more recent narrative seems to be that words are violence. So when words are violence, what should qualify as an incitement to violence? Steven. Um, that it's, a, it's such a, I hate this, because I'm gonna say this at the start of a lot of answers, it's a very complicated question. Yeah, you know, like when we say our words violence, the first question is, well, what kind of violence are we talking about? Um, are we talking about somebody getting fired from their job because somebody tweets that they are either an abuser or somebody that's racist? Some people would argue that's a type of violence. Um, are we talking about the type of violence where if you tweet something at somebody, they're you know, driven to commit suicide? Um, you know, that's a type of violence. Are we talking about just saying mean things to people on the internet without even really knowing who they are? You know, some people argue, well, that might be a type of violence. Um, so I think the question- Can I stop you for yeah, a second? Because yeah. I really want to examine the second one that you sure. just said. If somebody- said something to someone on social media that drove them to commit suicide, you, would you consider that an act of violence on behalf of the person who made the comment? So, in a way, yes. I think what's important to understand when we talk about our words violence, just because I acknowledge that something could be violent or offensive, doesn't mean that I necessarily think that that thing shouldn't exist. There's a lot of things we can say that are can be taken in an incredibly offensive manner. There are lots of things that we could say that down the road could lead to some sort of violent action. I think it's important that if we acknowledge that free speech is important, which I think it is, unlike the lawyer that was up here earlier, I like you, uh, the US free speech laws way more than the UK ones. I don't think you should be thrown in jail for teaching your you know dog how to do a Nazi salute. But if we are going to acknowledge that freedom of speech is really important, which I think it is, we need to understand the downsides to that as well so that we can you know, address them and deal with them properly in society when they come up. Well, when we hear, I think nowadays, when we hear things like words or violence, I feel like it's most commonly used in the context of pronouns, uh, discussions on race. Uh, you know, I have some of these questions coming up later, but I mean, while we're here right now, in your opinion, is misgendering somebody violence? These words are usually a proxy for other activities, and that's what nobody realizes, you know? Like, I don't think anybody actually cares if you misgender them one time accidentally, you know? People walk around acting like, acting like if you accidentally misgender someone on the street, they're gonna call the SGW police from Canada over, you know, the C-16 division's gonna throw you in, you know, some Canadian moose jail or something. I think the problem is that usually that type of aggressive behavior goes along with other things too, you know? Like, hey, um, I don't like you because of who you are, I'm not gonna give you any good jobs, I'm not gonna give you any good promotions, I'm gonna pay you less, I'm gonna treat you like shit. I think that these things tend to go hand in hand with each other. I think that saying words or violence is a little bit simplistic, but I also think it's a little bit silly to say, oh, well, they're only words. Well, usually these words are paired along with other types of actions. Everybody on this stage knows it, that people that say certain things act in certain ways as well. And I think it's important to recognize that. Milo, is misgendering somebody violence? Uh, no, of course not. It's absurd to say that it is. And I think we have to dilute the definition of violence down to the point where it means the same thing as hate speech now means, which is you know, there, there are as many different definitions of it as there are, you know, citizens of the United States. It's just stupid. It becomes, we get to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, and, and quite clearly, 
these videos of people losing their mind, you know, it's ma'am, are very much the, um, on the whole, they're the exception and not the rule. There does seem to be a particular problem with transgender people being a little um, uh, quick to temper, let's say. Uh, maybe it's part and parcel of the package of various dysfunctions that they have. Um, but on the whole, people getting very, very upset about these things are not actually getting upset. They're making a conscious decision to be offended. Uh, and that's quite clearly not uh, in response to a violent action. That is taking a political position. And very often, a lot of this stuff, it's important to bear in mind, is not really about whether or not you hurt me or not. A lot of the stuff that's going on in America at the moment, particularly with race, um, but also with a lot of these other categories of people and the various linguistic demands they're making on you, is jockeying for status. Now, where I come from in Britain, you listen to someone talk who sounds like me, and you would make very quick and very uh, obvious and mostly correct assessments of where I come from in society. You'd be able to figure out what kind of house I grew up in. You'd be able to tell what sort of school I went to. You'd know the kinds of books I read, and you'd know what my friends look like. But in America, things are very different. Those categories are much muddier. Uh, and that's because largely the class system has been replaced with mercantilism and money. Uh, capitalism is the only class system in this country, um, uh, really. And the only the dynasties you have here are financial dynasties, not, not really, when it comes down to it, uh, ethnic or even educational ones. So what we're really seeing, uh, it, it seems to me, with race and with, you know, with, with women, uh, with a lot of different racial, racial groups, uh, and even now with uh, transgender people, is jockeying for social status. Because even though America doesn't have clearly delineated class categories, everyone is very acutely aware of where they sit in the hierarchy and very sensitive to slights. And there's a lot, a lot of what goes on in American public life um, is, is dishonest and in his conversation at one level removed from what's really happening. And what's really happening is people are working out what the pecking order is. And in American society, we are currently in a situation where nobody actually really knows. We've got this very um, febrile environment in which black people are still trying to achieve um, uh, socioeconomic equality with whites, although they have largely achieved cultural equality, where women don't know where the hell they are because they're told completely different things by everybody. So nobody really knows where they are in the hierarchy. Most of what we're talking about, I, I see sociologically as jockeying for status. And I, 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 also, I think that this, this, this idea that, that, you know, that getting down this rabbit hole of language being violent and people inflicting damage on one another with misgendering, this is a very secondary issue to what's actually going on, which is really much more to do with class. Can I ask a question? Yes. I, I feel like, in some ways I agree, but I guess it depends on what you mean. When you say jockeying for s status, does that include like gay people that want to get married? Does that include women that want the right to have uh, medical procedures on their body without the government intervening? Uh, does that include trans people that might want to serve in the military? Does that include black people that well, take well, issue well, with well, being arrested yeah, for you know, parking rights or doing right? Like course. we call we call these social things. But they're but all I, status questions. They're all questions about which groups have access to which which kinds of civil rights. Sure, Those well, are that's status a, questions. That's a far different. Uh, uh, connotation, because when you say status, it sounds like you're saying like who's going to show up first in my Twitter feed, not who's going to be arrested for which crime, or who's going to have you know uh, which uh, civil liberties available to them in society. Well, they're all very closely linked, and we can see I weird dysfunctional uh, hierarchies of these different groups on uh, particular social networks that don't look like the real world at all. The social hierarchy, for instance, the status hierarchy on Twitter is almost a direct inversion of many status hierarchies in the real world. So I, I think they're all very closely related. And I, I think we're kind of talking about the same thing. I, I would completely disagree. I think that the reality of online social media is entirely unlinked from the realities, the political realities that we face. You can read um, study after study of how online Twitter is way whiter, more college educated, more likely to be male. Um, different online environments are more likely to be overrepresented by different people. For instance, the people that use Tumblr are far different than the people that use Facebook, they're far different than the people that use Twitter. Um, the idea that the, the rights that people fight for on Twitter, which is usually you know my favorite pundit got banned for seven days for tweeting something stupid, um, I, I think that those conversations are a lot different, and I would even say a lot less serious than, um, as a woman, do I have a right to get an abortion without being obstructed by some weird state statute that says I have to see a picture of a, of a baby floating in my womb for six days first? I think we can agree that there's a difference in seriousness. Okay. Um, I, I think maybe what I was saying is that we're, we're, I'm, ana I'm analyzing all of this stuff through the same lens, and, and what we're sp talking about specifically there conforms to that lens which I see to be the key to unlocking American society. But, of course, I obviously agree with you that 
in, in, in racial inequalities in the criminal justice system and uh, access to abortion are far more serious and pressing issues than the linguistic games that we seem to be so worried about. Sure. But I, I find something that Milo said to be interesting and I want to get your reaction to it. When he's talking about the inversion on social media uh, of certain uh, statuses, I think, what is your opinion about that? It sounded like you disagreed at first. No, I, mean, I, I think probably... you agree with me because you went through all these social networks where yeah. you said they are all completely different. But uh, was your point essentially that maybe racial minorities or maybe uh, LGBT people actually have more privilege on social media than perhaps I don't white think, people? I don't think they exercise it because they're often not present there. But that doesn't mean that the people who are present there don't create hierarchies that privilege them. So Twitter is white and college educated, but it is a place of social justice where people of color, disabled people, trans, trans people, the rest of it, are privileged above others in all kinds of practical, obvious ways. Uh, so it just, just because you know black people don't see the point of Twitter and aren't on it, doesn't mean that, that the privilege hierarchy there doesn't favor them. And that's, you know, something, you could even go a step farther with that. You know, if I go on Twitter and I say, I hate black people, we need to get rid of all black people, I'd obviously make good trouble for it. Um, not that I can. You get in more I, trouble on white Twitter than you would for saying it, you sure. know, in, in, uh, in Brixton or, or in Camden, New Jersey. Sure, but on the flip side, you can get a ton of people to go on and say, we need the Mayo side, you know, kill all white people, hashtag or whatever, and they don't seem to get in trouble for it. So there does seem to be some level of inversion there. But again, I would like to stress the conversations that happen on Twitter are so far removed from the political realities that, like, working class or middle class people live in that I think make it a separate conversation. We would Even agree on more of those than you probably imagine. Pro probably, yeah. One thing that I do think that Milo said that is incredibly true, and maybe braver than he thinks, that the last panel came so close to understanding, is that a lot of this stuff, when we talk about like SGWism and wokeism, does actually come down to class issues. Um, if you're ever curious why a corporation favors a certain policy, it's not usually because they're trying to maximize their wokeness or they want to be as uh, diverse as possible. It's usually because they're trying to make as much money as possible. And generally, being woke and you know being more inclusive to different types of people is usually the safest way to make a lot of money. Right, and, yes. the, and the stupid party, the Republican Party, does not seem to understand this about corporate America, which is why it can't fight it. Because it does not realize that the, imper that the incentives and the imperatives of big business may be completely different from those in the academy, but that does not mean that they won't use the same strategies to achieve them, because those are the prestige uh, mass market cultural values at the present time. And that's what graduates expect who are coming out of these awful uh, universities. Um, so I, I agree. 100%, and I agree as well. And that's why Republicans are very free market, open market, no government intervention. Which is stupid of them. But as soon as we start talking about social media platforms, well, now we sound like Venezuela trying to nationalize our, our social media platforms. No, I'm, like, well, see, I'm, I'm all for nationalizing and, Twitter. My problem is with the, my problem is, no, 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 look. You two are becoming best I'm friends. For, I'm all for nationalizing Twitter. My, pro my problem is with the hands off, red and tooth and claw, no borders, um, uh, uh, rampant free market areas, which clearly doesn't work. I came to America like almost ev almost every other. I was I suppose I've always been characterized as quote unquote far right. I came to America wide eyed and amazed by this fabulous wonderland where the free market solves everything. It fucking doesn't. Uh, it hasn't. Uh, and I've been very very quickly disillusioned by it by living here. And by living here in this time in this place, especially in the eighties, it probably would have been different. But right now, um, no, I'm 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 heading in very much the other direction. <laughs> 100%. The free market does solve for one thing, and that's the maximization of profits. Not freedom of speech, not freedom of expression, well, not it, just to make money. That's all That's all okay, so we want to do. Maybe we're not as close as I thought. Sure. I mean, <laughs> it, it is also, obviously, the greatest engine of prosperity. Lift has lifted more people out of absolute poverty everywhere in the world. 100%. I agree. I'm very much a neoliberal. Then we're okay. I'm not going to pretend that capitalism is going to give me a marketplace of ideas on Twitter. It's going to give me what the Twitter share, shareholders want to see. Then right. I send the most money for The stupid party wants to see capitalism unfettered, which we know leads to all kinds of absurdities, abuses, and ugliness. Um, I have found myself returning to what is a more Trumpian position, for instance, uh, not only in terms of protectionism and uh, you know national industries and all the rest of it, but also that big companies need guardrails, and sometimes they need to be broken up. And when, so, a, when a company has a complete and total monopoly on a certain type of speech, especially a kind of speech, I'm trying to bring it back to you, uh, a, certain, <laughs> uh, a, a certain type of speech without which people in particular professions, especially very successful popular people in those particular professions, cannot function without those tools, is a very powerful argument for regulation, which is why Twitter should either be nationalized or broken up or heavily regulated. Perfect, thank you. So on the topic of social media implications, uh, Stephen, in a live stream debate on, free, uh, on freedom of speech in September of 2018, you took a position on free speech that you are in favor of aggressively deplatforming those who engage in uh, uh, speech that is deliberate misinformation or gross misuse of information. Do you still hold those beliefs and why? 
Absolutely. So when we talk about whether or not words are violent or whether or not words can directly translate into violence, I do think that there are forms of speech that can be grossly negligent, where you can draw a straight line from the damaging things that somebody says to the damaging effects that they have. Um, you know, for the right, we complain that liberal college professors do this all the time, that they give a certain type of speech, students walk out of those college classrooms and they're indoctrinated. Um, Neo-Marxist, postmodern, neoliberal, whatever, neo-progressive, whatever new buzzword the conservatives are using those days. Um, and then on the flip side, you've got people like, um, you know, I can point to Donald Trump, you know, he comes out and he says, hey, you know, there's a medication, hydroxychloroquine, it's great, and all of a sudden, now the people that actually need this medication can't buy it anymore because everybody's buying it, you know? And that's just a piece of misinformation that once uttered causes, like, demonstrable harm in the real world. And I do think there needs to be some some look at like that spread of misinformation because it's destroying our ability to have conversation online. Um, I don't need to talk to Milo about people having you know bad opinions or ideas of you that have absolutely zero foundation in reality just because people go on and just make up whatever lie you know gets the most amount of views, the most amount of hits, and then the most amount of ad revenue. Right, and uh, I've been obviously been on the receiving end of that a, a lot. Uh, I agree with you completely, and actually something people don't often know, they think that the Supreme Court definition of free speech is, is uh, circumscribed by a couple of limitations, you know, uh, whether, whether the speech is likely to cause uh, imminent, immediate uh, physical violence or is likely to provoke it. But there are other things too that the Supreme Court has said do not fall under, um, you know, full First Amendment protections. Corporate uh, speech, you know, speech for commercial purposes, but also copyrighted speech, speech that someone else owns. I mean, if we had a system in, in Europe where you know you could more aggressively sue for that, I could be, put Turning Point UK, uh, USA out of business tomorrow. Um, you know, for, for you know, everything they do is, is, is ripped directly from you know, my 2015 college speeches. We don't have that, but there are also other things, and I think it's more like a, a sort of European model that you're, you're suggesting, which I kind of agree with, and I think this is actually what Trump wants too. When Trump was saying you know, that we should punish journalists who print misinformation, uh, my reading of what he said was, um, perhaps I'm being generous, but uh, my understanding of what he meant was deliberate malicious untruths. In other words, malicious libel. So we have laws for that in Europe. Uh, the UK has very tough laws. If you print something about somebody in a newspaper, you have to, you, you, if, if you're responsible, you, you, the editor will ask you, can you prove in court this is true? Because otherwise we can't print it. Now, maybe that goes a little bit too far. Maybe the bar is a little bit too high in Britain, and it does seem to be subject to abuse by the rich and powerful who find little you know, clauses that aren't even particularly damaging, take people to court, win, win whatever, and, and publications end up closing. But I agree with you. I'm sorry to say, it's a very disappointing for all of you. It's um, <laughs> a terrible night for you all. I'm sorry. What, what a finale this is. Uh, I, I have to agree with you that the, 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 the ideal legal position has got to be somewhere between the free-for-all we have in America where people can cause uh, purposeful commercial harm with malicious deliberate untruths which right now you can get away with if you're a journalist in America you can say whatever the hell you want and the British model which is a little too draconian in which you can't publish anything unless you can prove it with documents in front of a judge somewhere in between those two is the right answer UK is wrong we are wrong but somewhere in the middle is the right answer but the question was about deplatforming the question was about deplatforming, so I'm, I'm surprised to hear you saying that you agree so much. And, and well, I would say further than deplatforming. I don't, I don't just want companies to do it. I want the law to step in. I want the government to step in. When somebody, when, when, a, when a journalist publishes something they know is not true, and that's a high bar to clear. You know, if you're the, the sub, if you are the subject of. Uh, of, of libel, of defamation like that, you have to prove they knew it was untrue, or you have to prove to, to a judge or a jury's satisfaction that it's highly likely that they knew it was untrue when they published it. Not easy to do. In the um, US, almost impossible to do that. Right. So it's, 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 you, can, you cannot do it here, period. Even in Britain, quite a high bar to clear. But I want to go further. When somebody publishes something uh, materially damaging to your commercial interests, like for instance, when the press says, Miley Anopolis called Leslie Jones a monkey, called her an ape, never happened. Dis Disgusting, a lie, horrible. I was on uh, CNN Money the next day saying, I didn't do it, other people did it. I'm not responsible for what they say. You could say maybe I should tell my followers, but I don't consider that to be my responsibility. When that's been on CNN Money, when CNN.com then says the following day, Milo Knopp is called Leslie Jones an ape, and there's no tweets that say it, I've denied it in an interview, they cannot produce the evidence, that deserves an, uh, a response, and it deserves a legal response. But this, I feel like, begs the obvious question, 
who decides what is accurate information? Who decides what is truthful information? Well, that's what the judiciary is there for. Right. That's what the judiciary is there for. Well, so, it, you know, it depends you on the platform. Of Hydra, uh, ahead, yeah, it depends on the platform as well. So if we're talking about something posted on you know, Twitter, well, maybe that would be that platform's job to figure it out. Uh, if we're talking about things that rise to the level of legal things, so say defamation or libel, maybe that would be the, uh, the job of a, a judge to figure out or a court to figure out. This idea that um, people always act like this is like a, like a killer question. Like, well, how do we figure that out? Well, I don't know. How do we figure out what's inappropriate or seem to show children? How do you, you, know? feel, how do you figure out uh, if someone kills someone? Yeah, like, like the it's Supreme Court for, for inappropriate question. or seem It's literally like, I'll know it when I see it. That's like a like, literal <laughs> Supreme Court saying for how they figure it out. You know? that, is it hard to do? Thing. It's absolutely difficult to do. The, the thing that irritates me about this conversation is that if you want to say that we should be free speech absolutists, if you want to say that you know we should be able to get on and say whatever we want, that's fine. I think that's even a defensible position. Just don't sit here and pretend like it's going to be all perfect and it's going to the best ideas are going to rise to the top. It's going to be people, ugly. Yeah, it's, they, going, it's going to be disgusting. Just course. like capitalism. Just like when we took 100%. The, just like when we took the guardrails off American capitalism. Look what happened. Lots of amazing things. And let's be clear mostly amazing things, but also some absolutely dreadful things. That is going to happen with free speech, absolutely. I do think there is a difference with monopolistic uh, companies that occup occupy monopolistic positions. So I would, um, ironically, I would, I would like to see a Twitter that is required to, to have working, well-known journalists active on their platform and able to express themselves however they want. The consequences for that expression should be in a court of law, depending on what they say about other people. But when tw when you cannot be a working journalist without Twitter, we got to do something about that. When you cannot be a functioning media figure or internet personality without Facebook, and Facebook, I mean, Facebook is, has called me a dangerous individual, and their definition of dangerous individual includes people traffickers, international terrorists. And when they first dropped this policy, and they had to, to roll this back within 24 hours, uh, two things were true about dangerous individuals. The first one, you couldn't mention them on Facebook unless you said something bad about them. So you could only mention me on Facebook if it was to ridicule or criticize me. So this is a step beyond you know, free speech. This is literally delving into your brain and saying this is what you're allowed to think about this person and this is how you're allowed to express those thoughts. And even worse than that, and this is directly put into our discussion, as originally written and published, and this was vetted by Facebook's lawyers, it's one of the biggest companies, one of the most powerful, uh, richest companies in the world, multinational, conglomerate, whatever, as originally written until they were forced to back down, this dangerous individual's policy, which has been leveraged um, uh, almost exclusively against conservative media figures who get too popular and successful, Facebook's policy said, if you are one of the dangerous individuals, we will permit death threats against you on our platform, even immediate uh, credible death threats. This is the kind of death threat that the Supreme Court has said does not enjoy any First Amendment protection. And it is also, by the way, it should go without saying, a crime. This, these are death threats that are against the law. That if you do them, you will probably go to jail. Or you will, at a bare minimum, get in a lot of trouble. This, Facebook said, was specifically permitted in the case of these dangerous individuals, of which I am one, Laura Luma, Gavin McGuinness, Roger Stone, Alex Jones. That's insane. And that's the point at which the government should step in. Well, I, well I, I'm not entirely sure Facebook allowed that because I know that I, I've known a lot of people personally being on the left and sometimes more extreme friends that have gotten in trouble for living death threats across these platforms other people. Well, it was only for 24 though, hours and they got bullied into removing that oh, one. Sure, so, okay. so what's on there now is you're only allowed to mention certain people's names in a, in, in, in a negative context. What they originally published, the day they published it, it said, no death threats, ex uh, no credible death threats, no immediate death threats, no uh, uh, intentions, or expressions, or glorifications of violence, except in the case of dangerous individuals. It was an explicit entreaty, dare I say it, invitation to, uh, to smatter Facebook with death threats about the people that it had uh, designated to be dangerous individuals. So that was rolled back gotcha. very okay. fast within a couple I, of days. For, for the people that listen to this and the, the, the concept of freedom of speech, you know, it's like, oh my god, this is so wrong. Just as a reminder, this is Facebook exercising their First Amendment right. Uh, when you talk about free speech absolutism, part of that is, well, if I'm an entity and I own a platform, I can decide what goes on it. That's my freedom of speech. Uh, if you oppose Facebook's ability to limit or curtail what people post on their platform, then you're, you're actually obstructing their freedom of speech as a corporation or legal individual to do so. This is something you have to understand. This is why being a free speech absolutist, a although I may have been one of the best known ones, possibly the best one, known one, half a decade ago, is an ultimately insupportable position. Of course. Because, Steve, it, it, because it, it creates mayhem. Stephen, if you support aggressively deplatforming uh, those who engage in deliberate misinformation, uh, gross misuse of information, then where do you draw the line? What, what about parody? I, well, I mean, I, it would, again, it would have to be determined by 
I guess I don't know if you have like a you have like an arbitration thing that does. You could have it on. Yeah, I mean, like if you're clearly known as like a parody person, right? If Nathan for you does a skit on you know anti-vaccination, I'm probably going to take that a lot more um, as a parody than if Alex Jones comes out and says vaccines don't work. Like, I'm not really sure. You know, when it comes to satire parody, I mean, we make those decisions culturally. Is that guy joking? Is that guy not joking? Um, and in a legal sense, we kind of make those distinctions as well, right? Like parody is literally a part of copyright law. You know, can I take your song and make my own song over it? Well, whether or not you can or can depends on how transformative that content. I, making the decisions culturally to me or as a society feels uh, you're kind of making an assumption that we're all on the same page which of course we absolutely not. are not we're not but I mean we make we make a lot of people it's funny because you think that our values come from the law the law is informed by what we believe culturally the law will follow what culturally we deem to be acceptable yeah um, you know, it's happened with know, gay marriage it's gonna happen with marijuana like cannot, the law will follow we cannot legislate away cancel culture let's be clear right you can't pass the law just because it is an ugly and uh, an ugly runaway train right now uh, we, you can't legislate it away. It's wrong and it's destructive and it creates racists and it creates sexists and, and, and the, the manner in which it operates, the punitive and vicious, uh, uh, indiscriminate and disproportionate manner in which ca culture, cancel culture operates creates exactly the evil that it, it is purporting to um, defend against. And I suspect that for many people that's part of the point because I think the left has a bit of a, as Douglas Murray puts it, a supply and demand problem with bigotry. I don't think there are enough racists around, so the left has to create a few more of them with this, with this, uh, this shit. And I think they have. I think they have. And they, they do it in a variety of ways. I mean, George Floyd made no sense unless it was clearly your objective to make more white racists. Well, congratulations, you did. Uh, you know, America's at least 20% more racist post-George Floyd. Uh, you know, I, I think it was on purpose. Uh, the, finally, perhaps we can find a point of difference. Um, but, but, um, but, but, but cancel culture, you can't legislate away. You just have to um, viciously punish the people who are doing it. Unfortunately, when they, when they occupy prestige positions that are protected by monopolies, which are not regulated, and there's no protection in law for vicious, untrue statements made about people, these are the two problems we want to fix. That's the, those are the conditions under which cancel culture emerges. If we fix those two things, cancel culture would not flourish like it does. It would be a much, much less, less of a problem. Yeah, and I think real quick, when we talk about cancel culture, um, and, you know, I might get some pushback immediately, but I think that all of us are pro-cancel culture. Usually what we argue about is like, how wide or narrow should that band of cancellation be, you know? Um, if our employer liked an Alex Jones video, you know, should he be fired as our boss? Because he's, you know, a you know, compromise? Probably. What are you very mean about Alex? you got a hard on for him. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'm right, 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 you? Um, Think a different example of a God's sake. Okay, how about if they like a... People uh, will say they're in love. Sure. They like a Miley Cyrus tweet, for instance, okay? So we know that they're hateful and uh, anti whatever. Um, but, but like, if, if we have a boss, for instance, that goes out publicly every single night and they scream from the street corner, I hate black people, I hate black people, fight the chance, I kill them all, blah, 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 blah. Like, we wouldn't want this guy as a boss, right? Like, is it cancel culture to say that not every single person ought to be on every single platform? No. You know, no, the we, guy goes on a platform and says, I think I should be able to post pictures of underage children. No, Probably, I think most people would be opposed to that. So we're just saying that there we'll, should be social consequences yeah, for when, that. When we, talk about, yeah. when we talk about cancel culture, my, my main worry about cancel culture culture isn't that we cancel people that sometimes that band becomes very narrow where it feels like there's a sizable portion of the country that wants every single person that votes Republican out of a job which is that's scary to me well, that, but I don't think that's the same as saying like if you get on you know some massive platform and say well I don't think vaccines work don't do it and now we've got people that are dying of the fucking measles in the United States like holy shit like something has to change here and I don't think it's like an all or nothing like we can't cancel anybody or we have to cancel everybody kind of hey, guys, but I agree with all that, but we, we have a whole to... segment about cancel culture coming up I, I, we'll, we'll get to it but, 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 I'm going to help you again. Um, <laughs> well, I don't need you to help me, but I have two more questions for Stephen about social media She's getting implications before now. we get there. So, I, two more quick questions for Stephen about social media. Stephen, in a live stream debate with, and I apologize if I'm saying this wrong, Bastiat, you said, I think there are strong arguments for nationalizing certain platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Do you still agree with that position? Yeah, I mean, I think that what Milo said earlier it seems to be I true. I didn't know like, you said that. I'm so upset about how this evening is going. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately, <laughs> I actually this, said it This is going to do you just as much damage as it yeah. does me. The, the problem is that, but the difference is I'll be, consistent, I'll be consistent with my arguments. When I say that, like, perhaps we need to look at, you know, the strength of some of the social media platforms to where if you're banned from, if you're banned from Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, I don't know how much of a public voice you actually have anymore. I'm not, I'm not actually sure how effective you can be as a, as a communicator. Um, but I, I would extend that to go like, well, maybe we should increase, you know, like the strength of unions. I don't know if you can negotiate against an employer or whatever. Like, I'll, I'll carry that to its logical extreme. I won't just stop conveniently at social media because that's the only thing I care about because that's the only thing I post on. But yeah, I, I think there can be very good arguments made for the idea that if you get deplatformed across every single large social media, you've essentially lost your public square. Like in a way, that is the new public square in the United States and in the world.
Right. And, 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 and you know, as patient zero, um, like, I'm over it, it's fine. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 this, but this, this was like, I'm, I'm happy, I'm semi-retired, I live with a supermodel, I'm good. But I did used to make a hell of a lot more money. And I did used to be a lot better and more effective at my job. And for the kind of people who like me and agree with my points of view, um, it's not a good thing now that I can't go out and speak in public, that I have to have some, like, some absolutely terrifying guy like shadow me everywhere I go so I don't get killed. These are not good things. Um, and I wouldn't like it to happen to somebody on the left either because I think it poisons and much more, uh, much, well, poisons is, is too, is, is, is too uh, waffly a word. What I mean specifically is it impoverishes public debate. Why? Because the people in power don't take out extremists on the other side. They take out the most effective people on the other side. So this is why you see Stone, Loomer, Yiannopoulos, McGuinness, and, and Jones taken out on the right. David Duke still has his Twitter. Uh, Richard Spencer right. still has his Twitter. Nick Fuentes. Uh, Nick, uh, well, I don't put Nick Fuentes in the same category. This is a conversation for another day. Um, uh, they, they don't take out the extremists on the other side. They don't take out the people with actually socially unacceptable points of view. They take out the people on the other side who are making their life difficult. Um, and and that's, that's, you know, why, it's, why you shouldn't rejoice when you see it happen on either side. Um, I just, my, my, my big, my big, uh, my big move, my evolution, my growth with this question over the last five years is, oh, we did, it didn't work taking the moral high ground and these principles are all fine. Maybe we should just lean into these new speech codes. Maybe we should uh, bring blasphemy laws back. I mean, after all, they did work. So I, perhaps we should just forget all this shit and instead try to pass a law that makes it illegal to uh, uh, speak ill of Jesus Christ. Uh, that makes it illegal to deny the incarnation, uh, to de to deny the Trinity, to speak critically of the uh, of the orthodoxies and the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. I quite like that. Uh, I, 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 I wave that through. So uh, my my kind of my because uh, I because I kind of know where the questions are going roughly. I think um, my 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 big movement on this from from five years ago is uh, if we've lost the war for high principle and we're going to go in for these speech codes. Why don't we, you know, let's let's figure out what they're going to look like and who gets to who gets to make them? Because we can agree um, dismally and miserably for, for both of us uh, on on high-minded matters of principle as uh, educated and attentive observers of what's been going on for the last five or ten years. But quite clearly, reasonable people like this are not in charge of what's going on. So maybe we need a revival of the religious right. If the social justice is getting too out of control, if the left is getting too out of control, if they're canceling people for saying. Um, that, uh, that um, what did Julie Bindle say? A bed wetter and a bad wig is, is, uh, is still a man. If the casting people for that, maybe we just need our own version. And maybe, in fact, you know, the religious right, but with, you know, religious right, but better on Twitter is, is, is actually what we need now. Um, so that's, that's, my, that's my, my great moral quandary at the moment. I'm going to go ahead and say that we don't need that. <laughs> okay. Okay. This audience is not yet caught up from 2016. They don't realize it's 2020 yet. Okay, we're done. Final question uh, for Stephen in the social media. I, in the same live stream I was describing, you stated. You were a really big fan of the stream, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I watched like two of your I watched two of your favorite. He's the only one he watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the same. Like in the same a high school, school project, you got 32 quotes from the same source, and then you got like two quotes from Wikipedia. And in the same live stream. Yeah. All the other links are Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> you stated about Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh oh. You say that about Kylie Minogue. We were getting on so well. Finally, we were getting on so well. We were getting on so well. Well, that's about to change. All I want to know, all I want to know is if he lied, because if he lied, he's a hypocrite because he's breaking his own fucking rules. So well, go. Let me so read the question. This is from 2018, though. World's changed. You said, oh, no, I said 2016. You guys are very nervous all of a sudden. You are on thin ice now. Look at you. Look, I'm a fidgeter. Everyone thinks I'm on coke. I'm just like, can I call him a white nationalist or a Nazi? No, he's not. Look at his three four in his chair. Right um, now. Listen, I would let's like to see. I, I wanna, see. Hey, I what get did this, he say about me? I want to get through. Because I'm lovely. I, I would like to get through this quote. Apparently, we agree on everything. So, whatever he says about me must be true of him. Uh, what did he call me? All right. Uh, well, I would like to get through this uninterrupted. But he's like, I can't promise that, but come on. You stated about Milo Yiannopoulos. I fucking hate Milo. That fuck, that little fucking piece of shit. Dumb fuck motherfucker. Right. Pedophile, homophobic piece of shit. Oh dear. That sounds about oh right. Oh dear. Like that's to me, yeah. Do you stand by those statements today, and why did you call Milo that in the first place? Well, well there's a lot of insults in there. Which one you want? <laughs> well, I, I, well, I can live with dumb fuck. I can live with motherfucker. So let's go to the two most inflammatory and, and ones. Be, why no, did you call no, him a pedophile? And, no, and to be clear, homophobe is true. Yeah, but why did you call him a pedophile? <laughs> yeah, so the homophobe 
so the pedophile one was, I took a great issue with a stream that you had where you made it sound like it was a necessary part of the gay experience to have a relationship with an older man. That, that was something that struck me the wrong way, for sure. Okay, I think what I said was, as a recipient of that relationship, as the younger party in it, and not the older party in it, it can be beneficial for some of those young men because they, uh, when their families reject them, somebody can kind of inculcate them into life, someone can accept them, various things like that. Sure. This got grotesquely misrepresented by the right, incidentally, um, and then places like Newsweek, rather than saying, which is, you know, this slippery, disgusting thing, has been accused of covering for pedophiles, which was a lie, uh, total and complete lie, has been accused of being soft on pedophiles, Newsweek eventually contracted this to has been accused of pedophilia. And when I got in touch with them, they changed it very, very fucking fast. Um, but I, I am going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say that you were just uh, uh, reeling off insults and I won't hold it against you. Okay, well, I'm offended. I don't really get offended. I mean, I've said far worse things about myself than anything he can come up with. Are you sorry you said it? I'm oh, sure we both have. No, come that, on. That, what are you come doing on, here? That's bullshit. No, don't, don't do that to him. I want to know. His fan base will never forgive him. He's going to have to do a foul First of all, my, my, fan fan my fan base hates me Dude, for half the is, things I say. Is going, going to a, a protest more likely to get you COVID? <laughs> well, uh, any. Gosh, God, he's, you guys, they can do a foul check. I know, but it's part of your argument. Don't put him in that position. No, so I stand by what I said. No, so I stand by what I said. Granted, that's not perpetrating misinformation? No, I feel like the if you if you ask me to explain it, and I might even in that stream, and I don't know if that was just a string of insults we were going more, I feel like the the displaying that like um, these kind of like adult adolescent sexual relationships can be healthy for people even if in some reality that might be true I feel like it's a really harmful thing to perpetuate I would never okay but that doesn't yeah. that but that that's a very different thing to claiming that somebody fucks children no which I wouldn't yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. when you call someone a pedophile so by your definition you're in jail <laughs> Holy shit. good thing I live in, a, in the other country though <laughs> finally a little heat finally I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm over it. I'm like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> nobody could do any more damage to me than, than has been already done, and in some cases I did myself. But, but you know, just to be strictly accurate, when I, you know, when I, when I mean about people, I pick things that are real and true, and it's important to be careful about your insults because something like that, for instance, doesn't hurt. You could see it. Really, I was like, yeah, okay, I've heard that a million times before. Not particularly cutting. Whereas if you come this evening and said, Jesus Christ, you put on 25 pounds since 2016, mm -hmm. that would be both true and hurtful. Sure, I would, I would uh, qualify what I say then. Instead of calling him a pedophile, Maybe I would say pedophilic ideology enabler. I would well, say I would disagree right. with that, but at least, at least it's not going to get you in jail according to your own. Uh, Thank you. To you. Okay, fine. Let's, let's move on, shall we? Perfect. So moving oh, on. from your next live stream, Dustin, you called Milo. What's back to the topic of cancel culture for a moment? Uh, we see a lot of times these days not just canceling people for something that they say or may have said or uh, there's some sort of implication, but people are actually digging back now to tweets five years old, ten years old, or or even uh, video content that was created in the '90s or whatever. So should we should we be canceling people based off of things that they said in the past? As much as I hate to agree with one thing that was said in an earlier panel, something that is absolutely true is we are not allowed to grow and change as public figures. Right. Every single thing you've ever said at any point in your life is constantly the thing that you always believe right now, no matter how contradictory it might be to things that you've said currently. Um, you can go back in time to any figure. And, and the problem is, like, um, I say this all the time, I'm so glad that when I grew up, when I was a teenager, there wasn't as much social media that is like, um, you know, as uh, permanent as it is now, right? Nobody has a link to those old MySpaces or Live Journals or Zangas. Um, you can find all sorts of horrible, stupid shit that people say at, at all points in their life. The idea that if you ever own up to any of it, or if you apologize for any of it, or you recognize any of it from five or ten years ago, that people are going to try to destroy you, that's absolutely insane to me. Yeah, it's, uh, somebody came up with a good expression for it, uh, offense archaeology. Um, I actually don't mind or blame people especially when they just say, no, it wasn't me, must have got hacked. Uh, like Joy Reid did, I think it was Joy Reid, wasn't it, on MSNBC? Why would you ever acknowledge any of it? Yeah, there's no... No, no she, she had some old blog post where she wasn't particularly nice about gays or something, and I read it, and I was like, she's not wrong. Uh, but, 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 but no, I mean, she basically came out and said, someone hacked my blog and retroactively dated these posts and inserted them in there. Obviously a lie, but do I care? Not especially, because if she's a uh, black woman, coming from a particular community that has a has particular views. I mean, her views on homosexuality are very mild compared to what you, you would find in a lot of black Pentecostal churches. And I'm not asking the offense police to start knocking down the door and arresting pastors. And I don't think that her pandering to homophobic sensibilities, whether or not she has those uh, beliefs herself at the time, now, whatever, all the wrong questions were asked. The fact that she had an old blog post 
um, it's just it's inexcusable for people to go back and sort of, and, and surface this stuff later. And for her to turn around, wasn't me, got hacked. I kind of thought, you know what, fair play, girl. Um, like, you know, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, the only question that should have been asked is. Whether or not this was or wasn't you, what do you actually believe about it today? That's the only thing I really care about. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing. If somebody says something and you're not really sure how to take it today, and we kind of go back a little bit, you can establish like a pretty clear pattern of like, oh, well, you said this two years ago, you said this three years ago, oh, maybe it looks like you kind of do me in this thing. I think that can be valid. But this idea of going back, you know, like 10 years ago, you tweeted this, you know, kind of racist joke. So now you are currently like the most racist person. I think it's ridiculous. It's such a waste of time. There are so many more important things to talk about. But it's also insincere. Because what it means is that you've watched the person closely in the present day, and you've been unable to find anything good. <laughs> so you have to go back 10 so years to find I, an example you know, of it. Yeah. I, I haven't always been the nicest guy to my employees. Some of them I've treated very well, some of them I have not treated so well. And one of the ones that I did not treat so well sold my entire email archive to BuzzFeed. Um, and a story came out of this where I was apparently quote unquote close to white nationalists. What was actually happening was I was just buttering them up for a story like any journalist does. But with the emails they had, they could construct a fairly persuasive case and you know, BuzzFeed being BuzzFeed, who can blame them? They did the best with what they had. What they could not produce was a single, in this apparent example of me being you know, adjacent to or fully paid up member of white nationalism, a single example of me expressing an opinion in nine years of emails that was even remotely racially insensitive. Not a single word that was remotely uh, uh, critical or insensitive or offensive towards black people because they didn't exist. So they had to instead go back into history and construct something um, uh, using this, uh, this offense archaeology. So you know, not just because I've, I've, I've experienced it too, um, I've, I have not done it to anyone. Um, without, I, I have written pieces about people based on their past actions that I have uncovered. Uh, when I have approached them and said, "Do you still hold these views?" and they have said yes or not answered, or I found evidence that they have continued to hold those views into the present day. But other than that, I don't think I've ever done it because I think it's disgusting. Stephen, you made a comment a moment ago about how in cancel culture we're not really allowed to evolve at this point. Do you feel like there's a double standard that falls along political party lines? Because I look around sometimes and I see maybe comments Joe Biden made, certain people who tend to fall on the left make, and whether they be racially insensitive comments, they may be homophobic comments, but it's, well, I've evolved. Democrats seem to be able to evolve. Republicans seem constantly stigmatized by the labels of racist, homophobic, uh, bigoted, and they're never able to evolve themselves. Do you agree? I think for stuff like this, you really have to go issue by issue. Um, this idea that you, it's, oh, it's only a political thing. You know, they talked about it um, in a prior panel here. Uh, when you bring up like, oh, you know, Republicans, the politicians, you know, hold themselves to a higher standards than the Democrats. I mean, Al Franken stepped down over some stupid pictures, and the entire Republican Party was backing Roy Moore. The idea that this is a standard that only applies to one party is a laughing stock. The only people that believe this get all of their news from, like, you know, seven different Facebook groups. And, and also all like, of their money from one side of the party. Yeah, that too. Yeah. I don't believe this either. I have to tell you, Brad, I don't think it's true. I, I think it's a more complex picture than that. I do think that liberals are given more leeway because the prestige culture is left wing and because, you know, journalists point in a particular political direction. And if that's the sort of trivial point that your question is leading to, then yes, fine, I agree with you. I think more precisely, we have a lack of understanding on both sides about conservative media figures who dare to tiptoe into comedian or chat show host or something more than just barking in a podcast. Those people are not well understood and not really allowed to have jokes. Their jokes are tr treated like serious policy statements and their serious uh, opinions are kind of written off as jokes. Whereas on the left, we're happy to accommodate uh, people like um, uh, John Stewart and Bill Maher, I think it's a different hypocrisy. I think there is one, but I don't think it's the one you said. I, one question actually I would have for Milo on that, so I'll, I'll play the other side on that a little bit. Do you think it's fair that you can evaluate the same joke differently depending on who it comes from? <sighs> no, not really, because I think lived experience is complete nonsense. I think if a joke is funny, um, it's probably funny whoever says it. I think it can sometimes be funnier if the speaker is talking about a group they know well or laughing at themselves. So I think when uh, you know Chris Rock makes a joke about race relations that you know is obviously from his experience as a black guy, I think it makes his comedy a little funnier sometimes. But by and large, when you rip those jokes out of context, I think they're either funny or they're not. And I certainly don't think a joke goes from acceptable, funny, and safe for public consumption to unacceptable cause for cancellation and this person should get fired based on the speaker. No, I don't. So this is something where I would completely disagree. Um, Wonderful. And, and I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious on this. I feel like if you were to take a rural person and show them a, um, I don't watch much of his material, but like I'm pretty sure Larry the Cable Guy makes a lot of jokes about 
you know, hillbilly redneck, stuff like that. If you were to take a joke that he says about those types of people, I feel like they could watch that and enjoy it and laugh at it a little bit more than, say, Dave Chappelle making the exact same joke. Even if the joke is the same, it feels like we kind of color the joke based on who it comes from. That if you know a certain disposition a person has, you know their beliefs, it's kind of okay if they joke about something, but if there's somebody else and you think that they might, you know, actually be a little bit antagonistic or aggressive towards their topic, when they joke about it, it feels a little bit different. I feel like that's a fair stance that most people can take. I think maybe it's just a, diff a difference of degree, because, uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of already granted you that maybe it's a little bit funnier if the person is laughing at themselves, or a little bit funnier if they have some direct knowledge of it, but only really that's a kind of, that's a question about packaging um, more than anything else. I, I, you know, I, I think that, that for the most part, a well-turned joke is pretty funny whoever says it. Now, I mean, there are, there are great insult comics from the past, not many of them, you know, alive anymore, but the great straight white males of the, of the you know, hectoring, badgering, uh, uh, curmudgeon type, right? Who would tell jokes about other racial groups that today might make us wince slightly, um, but I still would not consider them cause for cancellation or, or, for, uh, or for concern. I think the main reason for all of that is perhaps that I don't see comedy as a way to alienate. I think by, by far and away, the overall effect of comedy is to unify. Uh, there's a reason why chat up lines are jokes um, at whoever's expense. Uh, I think comedy, tend, comedy brings people together a lot more than it divides them. And I think comedy is, a, is um, laughing at whoever, maybe laughing at a group that's not here, makes a connection. It, they're not affected by it. They don't have to watch you, but I'm making a connection with you, and we're laughing, and we're bonding, and we might be bonding about the uh, the plight of white people, and talking about how you know we had to be subjected to the sight of this you know royal wedding treatment on Fox News, of this gold coffin, of this awful you know uh, drug addict felon who holds held up a pregnant woman at gunpoint, a total scumbag that even Fox News was giving the royal wedding treatment to. I think it would be okay in that context. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I think it'd be okay in that context to make some jokes about, uh, you know, black tantrums, for instance, you know, in, 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 in respect of, uh, of rioting, whatever. So, no, I, I, I can't agree. I think comedy brings people together a lot more than it drives them apart. I mean, I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive positions. I think, like, I enjoy all sorts of humor. I think racial humor, dark humor, sexual humor. I think, I think yeah, I, I agree with that. But I think we have to acknowledge that somebody like, um, like a white guy coming up, I don't know what I'm allowed to say here, but a white guy coming up and doing like Chris Rock's old, incredibly famous skit that I'm not going to quote, um, versus Chris Rock giving that skit, like it, the, it's going to be taken a lot different. White people audiences. in blackface doing the N-word family and that kind of thing. It's yeah, it's going to be taken a lot differently than like, yeah, which I think is fair. Because uh, I, I think it, I mean, it comes across yeah, a little Yeah, but who's realistically actually going to do that? I mean, nobody. Who's going to watch it and enjoy it? Nobody. How many DVDs is this person going to sell? Nobody. I mean, who is that comic? I don't think they exist. Sure. <laughs> So we have about five minutes before we're going to throw to audience questions. I want to touch on the, the issue of social justice, hate speech and social justice. Uh, Milo, does anti-white racism exist? Racism of all kinds exists. If you have lived in America, around this country, in various different states for any length of time, you will know that the most, uh, the most racist group in the country is... Hispanics. Um, they hate absolutely everybody, including themselves, and everybody knows it. Um, absolutely world, it's not, and it's not even close. It's not even close. The way they talk about black people is monstrous. It is bone shattering, the way that they talk about black people. The way they talk about themselves, almost as bad. The way they talk about white people, well, it's ungrateful and it's in, you know what I'm about, whatever. Uh, yeah, who cares? But, 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 um, there, there, there is racism in all directions for all people. There's been an attempt recently to do this kind of postmodern exercise on the word racism, which is to deconstruct it and, and as, as you all know, uh, reimagine it as a system of oppression that is uh, exercised upon the powerless by the powerful. Um, it's all bollocks, no one believes it, it's crap. I am perfectly happy to see wild allegations uh, of racism, sexism, all the rest of it floating around society generally. Why? Because it tells us that the right and the left share some core values. We all think it's bad being mean to somebody because of their skin color and nothing else. We all think it's bad discriminating against somebody because of things they can't change about themselves. We all think <coughs> it's bad treating women like crap. The, f the, 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 the reason that conservatives get so upset about the allegations and that left-wingers make them so often is that we fundamentally agree on the values in question. Yeah. We're both agreed that racism is bad. We're both, we're both in agreement that you know, we shouldn't be, be engaging in a lot of these antisocial, bigoted, and uh, self-destructive behaviors. So I'm not too worried about 
about the allegations floating around, but what your the, the, what your question is getting at, which is this postmodern deconstruction and, and uh, attempt to, uh, at a sort of restitching together of what racism is and what it means, the, the Robin D'Angelo white fragility mm -hmm. thing, um, it's it's crap. It won't stick. Uh, it's got about another five years in it, and it's obviously nonsense. As anybody who has ever lived next to a Hispanic family knows, racism goes in all directions. Stephen. Yes, yeah, so I would take the, the, the actual complete total opposite side of this. Unfortunately, I think when we talk about uh, when we talk about racism, the we I think you spend like ninety percent of the conversation defining you know what does it mean to be racist. Um, if you're going to talk on the individual level, um, can a Hispanic person be racist against a black person or a white person? Um, as much as I'd love to fight my law on that, half of my family is Cuban, and that is, everything is, is absolutely true. Uh, but now, that being said. Has the class of white people ever been demonstrably harmed by Hispanic people? Absolutely not. Has the class of white people ever been demonstrably harmed by the class of black people? Um, maybe a few more people on Twitter get banned for something or whatever, but like it's a, the, the Holocaust? What? Did you say white on white people? No, no, no. no. I, I, in Someone terms had of, to yeah. say. So, sorry. Someone had to say it. Well, how, wait, how long did it take us to get to the Jews? I'm no, wait, no, 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 we did not This actually is That's a That would be an example of white on white crime, yeah. because Jews aren't white. Uh, yeah, but, 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 um, but, but, but real quick, so like, I think that it is important sometimes that... Well, well what about any, the effect of, of Hispanics as a class on blacks as a class? Wage depression, uh, the fact that in most societies, when you have waves of immigration, the previous ethnic group or the previous religious group, whichever one came in on mass, tends to move up. You know, if you look at Indians uh, from the subcontinent sure. this requires, in Britain, but this has this been... Isn't, this isn't race analysis, this is class analysis now, right? We're talking about new workers coming into place. Okay, but workers. we're just but we're just saying, you know, yeah. that the, the existence of lots of new illegal immigrants from Hispanic countries has a negative effect on the black yeah, population. Lots, lots of things, very boring statement, lots of things can impact lots of things in lots of ways. I think that it's important when we talk about like racism as a social construct, that sometimes we need to understand, you know, as a class, you know, there are certain groups of people that might benefit from certain power structures that other groups of people don't, you know? Um, one popular divide right now in the feminist movement is realizing that white women have been the recipient of more affirmative action than any other single minority group. It's caused quite a split in, in feminists in terms of uh, people of color and the feminist movement. It seems movement to only be a surprise to liberals. <laughs> well, no, I think most people understand it. Um, but the, the, the issue is that you have to be able to have the conversation. Uh, again, it's, it's the same as the conversation we had earlier about cancel culture. Um, if you want to acknowledge or fight against you know, certain ideas of, of structural or systemic racism, that's fine. But you just have to under, understand the, uh, the realities of what you're talking about. You know, These people that like to pretend that, well, a black person and a white person pulled over in any city in the United States is going to be treated the exact Exactly the same. Okay. You know, everybody knows that's not true. Don't don't pretend that it's fine. Is. Obviously, it's trivially true that we should be able to have these conversations. I just reject your framing entirely. You know, left left wingers tend, on the whole, I'm making very broad generalizations here, tend to talk, think in terms of systems. Uh, you know, you're born into a system, and you know you have limited power of that system. Whereas right wingers tend to think in terms of traditions, and because left wingers think in terms of systems, often more, in a more abstract sense, it's easier for them conceptually to break and remake. Them. Conservatives want to kind of tinker with their institutions because they know it's from the institutions, Catholicism, capitalism, property rights, you know, the rule of law, all the rest of it, that the strength and, and, and success of society flows, of the family. Um, and, and I just completely reject the systems analysis that you're doing about structural racism. Doesn't, that doesn't mean that there aren't socioeconomic inequalities that stem from certain things. But the idea that that can map onto allegations of racism and then suggest to, uh, affirmative action programs or reparations. I actually don't mind the argument for reparations, but for very different reasons. This, the whole structural frame uh, the, of, of critical race theory is complete horseshit. Uh, it is economic Marxism mapped onto social issues in a very shoddy fashion that doesn't work. And it will not work. It, it won't hold. It won't hold because it, it just doesn't bear the slightest bit of scrutiny. It doesn't work when you do it with gender. It doesn't work when you do it with race. It especially doesn't work when you do it with transgender circus people. Sure, so um, I, I don't it just, it just, you're, 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 the, the, the systematic frameworks that the left use all the time, they say, well, we've got to be able to talk about these things. I will talk about these things, but I will not talk about them in the terms that you are asking me to, because the terms that are, that, what, 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 this is another, um, I'm not having a go at you, by the way, this is a very abstract yeah, thing about okay. where, where the left argues from. Another thing they do, in addition to censorship, is setting the terms of debate by redef redefining words like racism. So in order to have the discussion at all, you've already got to grant them the premise that racism is actually uh, a function of a system you know, that, that, uh, that, that uh, privileges some above others, and there's this oppressive cloud, and it has various effects. 
this is a this you're granting so much of the enemy's argument that from that position you can only lose. And this is just entirely the wrong frame to look at anything, uh, well, especially, especially history. Sure. Well, I can understand um, some of that. You're begging the question if you uh, agree with my definition of racism. I already won half the argument, of course. Um, there's a reason why we look at things in terms of like massive structure or systems. Um, and that's because that's the level that government policy works at. Um, one of the big frustrations that I have if I talk to conservatives is people want to reject any type of uh, structural analysis in favor of, well, what can individuals do? Well, I don't know, but that doesn't really matter. We can't really affect an individual change on like a wider governmental level, or even on a wider cultural level. Like we typically talk about these things in terms of uh, people. Even if we look at like religious commandments, right? We talk about how men ought to act, or how women ought to act, or how the institution of the church, you know, needs to uh, do policy. If you know, you you were Catholic, I was Catholic as well. I appreciated your earlier conversation about uh, transubstantiation. Uh, you know that there's a structure even to the Catholic Church. You've got your archdiocese, you've got your rulings that come down from the Pope, you've got the Catechism. Uh, even the even the Catholic Church acknowledges at some level of structure that's given given to your entire class of people, and then that is actually broken down based on are you male, okay, but, you're talking, you, but you're talking about uh, in, institutional hierarchical organization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a completely different kind of, of thing from a social justice frame. I think it's a lens it's, through it's, which it's, you look at the state. I think that it's very valuable to be able to look at groups of people and to make statements about how people act and then how they ought to act. I mean, we, we okay, need to have those conversations. Okay, but that's your claim out to the point where nobody could disagree. Uh, well, that's, or, that's or, literally or, what class, like, or, or, theory. The point I was trying to make was that, I'm sorry, I did, I did interrupt you. Uh, no, the, the point that I was trying to make is that very often we have these debates, and indeed the one we've had tonight has been an example of this. We have the debates on their turf. Now, as it happens, he and I agree on some core civic values that I think most respectable, reasonable people will agree on. We will disagree horribly on all kinds of other things that are outside the scope of the debate tonight, I'm sure. But, just to give you an example, when does comedy go too far? Well, you can look at it from the point of view of fence taking socialists and the rest of it, or you could reframe it. You could say, well, comedy actually means something completely different in the real world, in literature, for instance. What kind of comedy are we talking about? Are we talking about paradisical, purgatorial, or infernal? Um, infernal comedy, uh, uh, following you know Dante, is very much what we see online, and that's you know disembodied, uh, demonic, and dreadful. Uh, purgatorial comedy, which is the kind of thing you're talking about, like stand-up jokes going too far, is something uh, is, is is, is rooted in, in the possibility of redemption. So are we talking about whether these people can be saved from their, or whatever. They're, I'm Got getting it. off the point, but I'm trying to explain to you that there are frames that we can talk from that have much, first of all, they're much more useful and much more interesting. They draw on a body of literature and history that lefties just don't know. And they also get us much closer to the truth, much closer to, to enlightenment, and much, much closer to one another. And right almost on. every debate I've heard in the last five years has started over there, and we've been scrambling to, 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 uh, to, to grab the, the, the debate field back from them since they've demanded that to even speak at all, we've got to use their language. So this is what I'm trying to encourage you to do in your debates with your friends, is all just right. say, whoa, 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 take a step back, all that shit, let's start again. Milo, we're gonna have to leave it there because we're gonna take some audience questions before we wrap up tonight. I'm going to try and drive a bit of a wedge into that now. I have a bit of a blind spot for Stephen, but I'm interested in this. Um, Milo mentioning very early on in the, the talk about how bullying should be encouraged. And I, I'd like to talk about maybe the importance of, of making people, or what is the obligation of, of us to make people less fragile and more resilient to the effects of words? And also, is, is there value in the idea of, of of banter or or, um, or dark humor in bringing people together and actually bringing us closer. If we're recognizing our differences and we're, we're making humor about that, is that building, can that also be enforced to build bridges of trust and bring us together? I can be super quick and give them most of the time. Um, uh, first of all, it's uh, bullying and uh, building resilience through stress and through inclement circumstances isn't just a good thing. It's absolutely necessary uh, for, for people to, to, to build healthy, happy psyches. And second of all, you know, is teasing and all the rest of it, um, is this a kind of acceptable way to go on? Is this a good thing? It is an absolutely critical and, uh, um, and, and, and um, indispensable way that men communicate. And one of the reasons that ridicule and criticism has been uh, so maligned online is that our discourse has become very heavily feminized. So ri ridicule and criticism have become recast as abuse and harassment because when you say mean things to women, they cry. And we don't want to be like that because we're nice gentlemen who are chivalric and we don't want to see women cry in public. But the fact is that taunting 
teasing, being mean to one another is how men bond. You will never change that. All you will do is drive it underground and make it surface in eruptions if you try to suffocate it. This kind of thing you're talking about, bullying, taunting, being mean, trolling, it is what men are, especially working class men, by the way, um, which is why so much of this um, uh, debate is, is rooted in class, because a lot of this is a class war against middle class journalists on, on working class people. Um, but the, being mean to one another is something women do behind one another's backs and men do to each other's faces. You will never change that, you will never fix that, but the way that men are with one another, this is what's being driven out of public life and being uh, maligned, and it is, it is absolutely devastating for Stephen. modern male. The idea that you have to be a bully to be a man is such an emasculating way of no, looking at masculinity. Well, yeah, but this idea that like bullying is inseparable from the identity of, of being masculine, I, I think is incredibly silly. I think it's important to recognize that there are different types of bullying. If we're, if we're going to say that, like, should you be able to tease your friend over something or, or make fun of something, I think that's fine. Um, bullying a kid every single day at school to the point to where he's crying and then goes home and hates his life, probably not okay. I think one of these we can say, sure, yeah, I, I think it's important to clarify what we mean when we say bullying. Um, in, in terms of, like, there, there are a lot of bold ideas that we have about what makes a good person um, and what makes a resilient person. The problem is all we see are these success stories. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that we know that we used to think is really good that just doesn't work. For instance, like spanking your children. It's just, it just doesn't work. And, and we've looked at this, you know, study after study after study, um, result after result after result. Every now and then you'll get a very successful person that survived it, but what you don't see is the thousands of people whose, um, who, whose attachments to other people in life are ruined, who are depressed, who can't form healthy relationships. You don't see all those people. You only see the one successful guy that survived it, and now you must think, oh, well, you know, I guess these people are uh, very resilient ignoring all of the failures behind that person. I was spanked as a child growing up, and I will spank my children when I have children one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look, I it's, not, it's not the first thing you try to use with kids. I mean, I've kind of inherited kids now. I've got a, a stepson and a stepnephew who live with us, you know, 16 and 17. Um, it's certainly not the first thing that dad reaches for, but here's another thing that a lot of the women won't like. I heard a lot of muttering and sighing because they don't like it when you tell them the truth. Well, fortunately, I don't want to fuck any of you so I can tell you whatever. <laughs> so, another thing you might not like to know is men need to be afraid of their dads. And so do girls, especially women actually, because women who aren't afraid of their dads go out and get husbands they're not afraid of either, and they're both fucking miserable. Um, you know, there's, there's an extent to which being aware of your dad's power as a man helps you to come to understand your own, and helps you to learn to channel and manage and control it, rather than sublimating it with drugs and turning it into a school shooter, which is what I, we have I, now. Think, I think, real quick, I think it's really important to recognize that respect doesn't have to come through fear. And uh, I think that everybody... Where does it come from, I think, Well, I, well let's be honest. One of my favorite... One of my favorite... One of my favorite... One of my favorite... One of my, one of my favorite go-to examples is every single person in here, some of you graduated through the school system, has known one of two types of teachers. There is one teacher that will give you a demerit or a detention or a mark on whatever card, no matter what stupid little thing you do. They exercise their authority over you at every given opportunity. And then you have that one teacher that you have so much respect for. They might have passion for what they teach, they might treat their students with respect, and you can get a million detentions from that, from the earlier teacher that's so quick to send you to the principal's office, but if you disappoint the latter a single time, you just you feel so I horrible. think it's a terrible and analogy, I, because since when were 14 year olds afraid of getting detention? For a lot of young people, it's a badge of honor. There aren't, there aren't, there aren't a lot of people afraid sure, of that, but that doesn't produce point. fear. And those teachers okay. who are nice, who you say are point. respected, they're not and respected, many, they were pandering and trying to be the kid's friend, how and the kids many got 16, away with murder, and how so many, they remember them fondly. How many 16, 17 year olds have been hit by their dad so many times, you just don't care anymore about it, that eventually go well, off that's and drugs, that's, that's a different no, issue. Okay, no, guys, no, no, it's we've got a long line of people who'd like to ask some questions. Let's keep the answers brief. We will do parenting next week. Next right, go week, ahead, parenting. sir. sir. Uh, to start with, Milo, I'd like to compliment your fashion, Peng Shui. Uh, yeah. Those shoes go well with your outfit. You know, I was worried. I was worried because I was getting dressed. Worry not. I was, sexy, no, I was getting dressed indoors, and you know, it's very difficult without LEDs or natural light to know exactly how it's all going to come together. But thank you. You made the comment in the hotel. I saw you. I wasn't sure if it was you. You know how I knew it was you? The I looked down and you were wearing some sparkly fucking boots. And I was like, that's oh, gotta be Milo. I was in Milwaukee. There's no way that's anybody in Milo. boots. It's true. I was in Joel's boots. I was in Milo. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to read you the words of a wiser man. It's as if our moral safeguards are broken down by the new landscape in which the default is attack, such that we forget that there's a person or a human being on the other side. So perhaps what's needed now is a bolder form of censure. After all, the internet is not a universal right. If people cannot be trusted to treat others with respect, dignity, and consideration, perhaps they deserve to have their online freedoms curtailed. 
I wrote this quote this, down for <laughs> No, no, this is this is this is what why this wiser person he is of course recalling my own youth yeah, stuff. Uh, this, this, is, this is one of my favorite kinds of questions. Um, uh, as I as I said this evening, I have matured since twenty fifteen. My twenty fifteen position was very different from that. I think it's reasonable because the online landscape is completely different than ten years ago when I wrote that or eight years ago when I wrote that. It does not bear any relation whatsoever. In the very early days of Twitter, um, I, I, I took a slightly different view of trolls than I later came to hold, which was actually that they were the uh, the, the the last uh, precious keepers of uh, of, of polemic. And ultimately, uh, uh, civil disobedience, and of course, you know, Gamergate and everything like that. Um, I, I, I embrace them fully, and I still do like trolls and all the rest of it. My problems with free speech come from people abuse. Typically, come now, I think, from people abusing positions of power. I still love a good troll. So um, I, I don't think when the internet changes as, as much and as dramatically as it does over the years that it's unreasonable that a commentator's views would, would mature with it. But I appreciate the um, I appreciate the the audacity and uh, and I appreciate the uh, the effort. So Milo has evolved. Stephen, do you have any comments? Um, I, no, mind? I mean I, I actually I, I read that quote. A lot of my uh, opposition research was uh, relating to your early publications. But I actually find that your uh, your current um, your, your current point of view actually seems to coincide somewhat with that. I don't know if you would be completely in disagreement about a lot of what, even that quote in and of itself, but there's a lot of people I online. think I shot to an extreme, and I'm settling on a more reasonable uh, position. Yeah, possibly. I think it's fixed. One thing that also, sure. I think trolling has changed a lot, too. When we said, when we talk about a troll like 10 or 15 years ago, the idea of being a troll is that you knew you were saying some dumb shit, but that's what made it funny. Nowadays, it's hard to tell who knows if they're right. being and then, Now there are layers of irony. Yeah. There are movements that are, that you know, Game of Game is this example where some, actually things could be accomplished or at least culture could be changed by large, um, uh, uh, some more organized groups of people who you would call trolls, but they were acting in a particular direction with a particular um, uh, mo uh, you know, motivation in mind. So I, I thank you, for, that's generous of you to help me out like that. But so, I also think, yes, the definition of troll has changed somewhat too. Uh, earlier it was stated that uh, people should be deplatformed for having the wrong ideas. My question is, who gets to form the Committee for the Preservation of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice? And if you give... Uh, uh, Sir, can you speak up a little bit? We're okay. having a little trouble here. Shall I start from the beginning? Uh, I heard from who gets... Who gets to decide deplatforming? Okay. Oh. Okay. Who gets to decide who forms the Committee for the Preservation of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice? And if you get to set that structure, well, there's a nice that building power. In, in the middle of Rome. Uh, it, it's uh, it's, oh, it's St. Peter's. Uh, you walk in, it's a lovely circular colonnade. <laughs> I'm, I'm not door, finished with my you, question, and you, and you my love. St. Peter's Basilica. And in St. Peter's Basilica, you will find all the answers you're seeking. Go ahead, and minister, that, and ignore him. Um, <laughs> and once you set that structure and, and give that power, are you willing to accept that the uh, committee could be formed by the Westboro Baptist Church? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I imagine this is probably a question for me. I, I mean, it would depend on the particular issues we're talking about regulating. So to, let me be very clear, because I get misquoted on this all the time. Honestly, and I get a lot of flack, because I don't really care that much about hate speech on public platforms. I mean, you probably shouldn't do it because you're a jerk if you do it, but I don't care about, like, banning or whatever. What I care about are, are people that come out and say things like, like, I, I brought this up several times, you know, like, vaccinations aren't real. Or Hillary Clinton, like, flew the plane with the uranium on it to drop cash off to Iran and then went and visited Putin and then they went underneath some pizza place and had sex with 35 kids or whatever. Like, this is the kind of stuff that I'm looking at when I'm like, what, what, what am I reading? Because I think that this stuff is Trump truly... Trump including Russia. You yeah. were... You were you, uh, yeah. Well, no, that was actually a Mueller Trump, investigation. Trump, yeah. It was actually federally funded. That, had, that actually produced a lot of credible Thank indictments. You. So I would say that's a far different thing. But I'm talking General about like Flynn, um, Roger Stone. You, we get the right, idea. Right. Sure, I, I'm talking about stuff that is like just demonstrably not true information that's being published online, especially in like a, 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 a scientific uh, arena. Th this is the kind of stuff that I think is like just damaging the public discourse. Like when we get these conspiracy theories out here, we're not even having good conversations anymore. We're just arguing over you know which pizza shop was the you know, whatever. Britney Spears or somebody hidden in, you know, I think that's ridiculous. I, I think it's true, and I want to pay you a compliment. I know that I'll, I'll be as fast as I can. I, I had an online debate with, with uh, Mr. Jingles or whatever his name was, and I was really <laughs> horrified this evening was going to go the same way, and I thought, fuck, things are so much worse than they were five years ago, and they've got so much worse while I was away, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Um, this evening has completely changed my mind about that, and I'm sure on future occasions we will have much more... Um, I'm sure on future occasions, 
we will have much more testy exchanges, and I look forward to them, and I look forward to us uh, uh, besting one another in both directions. But but the, the particular kind of hysterical, I think he was a little bit Adderall up, um, hysterical, bad faith, uh, debate bro bullshit that I had from this guy made me think, fuck, the left, is, the left is trying to imitate our energy of 2016, but they've got nothing new to say. These are cardboard cutouts repeating the same old tired platitudes, and I'm fucking, no thanks, I'm going to go back to building houses for a living. I actually uh, saw But tonight that. has completely changed my mind. I just want to thank you for being here um, and having a, having such a nice conversation with us. It, it is greatly it is greatly to your credit that you have the you know the intelligence that you do, but also the integrity and decency to have a real conversation because it isn't that common. When was the last time uh, somebody from his side? Of, I mean, look, he's not you know. Marxist, whatever, he's, you know, somewhere in the middle of the left, but when was the last time any of them showed up and, and had the basic courtesy and, and intellectual honesty and decency to have a good, good discussion? Well, that's a backhanded compliment it's if you ever got it's one. Red. <laughs> sorry, sorry, go ahead. Hi. Um, so, I have a question. When it comes to, like, the safe spaces that are going around in college campuses, how can someone cop it? I know you. I can't see you, but I know yeah, your voice. Yeah, I know right. you, too. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So, when it comes to the safe space... The bathroom is 45 minutes ago by the time. They're going around <laughs> college campuses. How can someone combat the safe space culture? But people nowadays are so fucking sensitive. Okay, so I think that safe spaces are incredibly valuable to have in areas where they're appropriate. I think, I don't know what happened, but somewhere in, in the American education system, we forgot the idea that, like, the, the, through education, that's like the safest time in your life to introduce you to opinions that might bother you. Um, I think that there's a lot of value in having a room or a space where I just want to vent about something and I don't want somebody to judge me for it, I don't care, I just want to complain about this shit and be done with it, I think that's fine. But the idea that you're starting to put trigger warnings on, on like world history courses, that's absolutely insane to me. I think college should be a time where you are challenged, where you have to confront ideas that might make you uncomfortable because that's part of growing up. And it's, it's, if there's any time in your life where you're going to have the opportunity to take an idea, dissect it in a classroom among peers and understand it, it's going to be college. So I, I think that the concept of a safe space is very valuable. It's very, we shouldn't lose that. But the idea of making everything a safe space is absolutely ridiculous. And I think it's misused too much. I think, I think you're a conservative. I think you're a liberal, and I'm getting very confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, look. I, no, I think safe spaces kill people. I think trigger warnings are massively counterproductive, insulating people from trauma they need to confront, so they get over it, get used to it. Exposure therapy is the only way to help if you have traumatic uh, uh, experiences in your life. You have to expose yourself to little doses of it until it doesn't bother you anymore. Trigger warnings um, are, are, are a fast track to uh, to mental illness and suicide. So. Uh, um, I'm, I'm glad we at least have two or three things we disagree with. Sir. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all, both of you, for coming. I know y'all are incredibly busy, and I really appreciate the conversation that y'all had because, uh, to be honest with you, I usually disagree with both of you all a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Milo, it's really fucking hard to disagree with you because I really appreciate the way you dress. It's really <laughs> It's but, not by accident, sir. <laughs> it's not an accident. I've got the accent, and I've got the suits. And, you know, if I show up with a good argument, that for me is a good day. Listen, I can relate. So with that being said, I do have to ask you something. So earlier you you challenged uh, uh, Stephen, right? I know you don't like all about this. Yeah. You challenged Stephen's I idea of systemic racism, but you didn't actually off. You like were just kind of went on a tirade about like, oh, it's framing is bad. Framing is bad. We gotta do it from a different frame. We gotta frame, 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 frame. And I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for him to give me an example of why his definition was wrong. Because I can just point to a simple example that I used on my panel earlier, which is FDR introduced the new, the new Deal, which introduced the Fair Housing or the Federal Housing Administration that made sure Black people cannot get so, you know, move into the suburbs which of course means they can only get public housing, which means they can't get real education because 93% of all education is funded by property, property taxes. Tax. And therefore, well, that would, I think that that's a system. You've done a good job already of making my point for me, which is one not based on some nebulous concept of past trauma inflicted on one group to the other. Because when we talk about you know uh, the, the harm done to black people, we're talking about their feelings. Uh, we're talking about the no, 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 no. I, no I, we're not talking about their feelings. We're talking about I mean, I they're can't talking almost. about their feelings. Um, but a much more useful frame, which you've just provided, which I think is illustrating my point for me, is economic. Uh, economic self-interest of various ethnic groups, uh, and perpetuated and, by what? 
uh, well, perpetu perpetuated by the self-interest of different ethnic groups. And you can't say white people. Understand that America is not a monolith. Uh, you, know, you can't generalize about white people just like we don't generalize, or we should not generalize, about the black community. But we have lots about it. LA right? blacks are very different. So, 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 so I'm a debater. So, okay, can I just say something real quick? So I'm a debater. I know what you're doing. All right. I, we, listen, I got you. I understand what you're doing. But I never say anything about white people. I said the See, I got the suits. You got the cute little so the thing you're doing. Well, I try. <laughs> so, but I'm talking been, specifically. He's, 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 he's getting me all hot and bothered, so I can't <laughs> think clearly. Trust me, I, I have. I think I had an effect on both genders, so it's cool. Um, but oh, no, oh, serious, oh. Is, um, when we were, we're, I didn't say, but white people. I said the system perpetuated. The white people, if you want to say that, use the system to perpetuate a very specific targeted racism. So how do you not accept his friend without offering... Well, because I don't think race is the primary motivating element in any of this. It doesn't have to be the primary motivating element. But if we say, for instance, it's funny because conservatives will talk about how important the family is, and we should focus on the family, or how important your culture is, and we should focus on the culture. Yeah. Well, oftentimes, you know, what, what does the success of our parents come from? You know, it comes from where they live. It comes from what their grandparents did. It came from where they lived. It came from the schools they went to and the neighborhoods that they lived in, the communities that they were a part of. But we had laws on the books you know, not even one generation ago, that literally said, you can't live here, not if you're poor, not if you are, you know, wear your pants a certain way, not if you listen to too much rap music, but if you're black. Um, and I'm not gonna say that every single problem that black America or white America has today can go back to racist laws in the books, but to say that it has no impact Well, I didn't say it had no, I didn't say it had no sure, okay. I don't think we're really, dis any of us are really disagreeing on anything. I find other explanations for the plight of black America more compelling than the uh, mysterious uh, uh, and powerful supernatural force of white supremacy uh, and structural racism. I find other explanations much more compelling, religious explanations, uh, economic explanations, geographic explanations, uh, historic, you know, historic explanations. I find lots of other Economic, things. geographic, historic that were all influenced by System. Well, obviously, 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 <laughs> obviously, all these things are interrelated. You, I mean, there, there are people. The are, there argument. are people. Somebody that I would. <laughs> I am intersectional, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone's intersectional to the extent that they understand that things affect each other. So, if, you know, if you have an intersectional identity, it means your life is shit for more than one reason. Like everybody gets that idea. It's not like you know, it's it's not like some eh, intersectional intersectionality detected. We're all intersectional because we all understand that things can happen in one cause. I think. I think that's a. Really Really good point, and we probably do agree on most things. I, I think sometimes it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. You have a room full of black people and a room full of white people, and everybody has a hundred bucks, and you take ninety bucks from every black person, and then when people go to try to buy stuff, you say, "Hey, well, you know, this is an economic problem, not, not a race problem." And it, it, it's because it you're on that them. side of the room. Yeah, I mean, it leaves a bad taste. I was like, "Well, yeah, is it kind of well, economics? I, yeah, is it kind of region? Yeah." But okay, a lot of this well, stuff I, back I, on the I, books. I think we could talk for a while about why that now. Is All right, guys, just, we have about five minutes and two more questions. I think, uh, I think again, we're in a difference of emphasis rather than you know some horrible. Clash of world views. Go ahead. Oh, so, Milo, uh, hi, Milo. I don't know if you remember me, but I am Mr. Jingles. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, 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 well, I know I'm so glad you're here. Do you see how it's supposed to be done? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is awful. So, no, no dog. No, no buddy. I Your white fertility is showing right now, Milo. This is very upsetting to me. This is very upsetting to me. Because, like, I have just been informed that I, uh, that you had a very, very negative experience uh, when you interacted with me. And that, and I hope, you uh, I hope you can accept my uh, explanation that that was by no means my intention. I did not mean to offend you, but because I did uh, read my fragility from front to back, I know that because of, just because I didn't mean to offend you doesn't At mean, all again, you see, this is your problem. You've got to slow down, sweetheart. <laughs> slow down, relax. We're all here for you. Thank We're you. getting here you to the end. You truly are my buddy. We Thank you very much. <laughs> well, maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Maybe now. Dog. Come on. All right. All right. Okay. All, all right. right. I, 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 oh, you're going to make me apologize to you earlier? Remember when you said that? You said no, I should apologize no, no, to you, no, and no, now no, you won't even call on your dog? Now, uh, now you I, excuse, I excused you from issuing any kind of apology. What's the next question? I'm not excusing him because he was a shit. It was a nasty. Do you have a question? Shit, uh, arguing and I would love to ask it eventually. But, yeah, let's but, get to, let's, well, let's, what, why don't we just show what it is? Look, uh, the reason the reason that I offered for them uh, for me to come back on again is because they paid me to appear, and I felt bad about how fucking what a fucking car crash it was. So that's why I wrote and said I had a bad experience, and the moderator wrote back and said, "I'll find you somebody who argues in better faith." He was uh, not satisfied so, with the uh, So what I, what I what I will say is I'm very happy to have another conversation with you, and maybe we can start fresh. 
Well, th that, my question might actually help with that because, like I said, I did not mean to offend. I did not think that the words buddy and dog would be so negatively impactful for you. But again, I want to take those seriously. So I want, uh, based on your conversation, I would like to, uh, uh, maybe you can help me with this. What is the difference between getting genuinely righteously offended uh, against a genuine slight versus uh, an offense that maybe, like you said earlier, that you should probably just get over? Uh, I'm in a bad position to answer that question because I can't really remember being seriously offended in my life. Um, I understand that sometimes people claim to be, uh, but I, I, I have no real direct knowledge of what it feels like. It strikes me as, as enormously and profoundly silly. Uh, and I, I really don't know what people mean when they say I'm offended. I think what they mean is I don't have an argument for you. Um, I, I just don't really know what people mean by it. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. That's, I don't know if that I mean, will help it's me. Not, it's, it's not a great answer, but it's, it's the truth. Thank you. Last question. Hi, my question is for Steven, actually. So I, um, this, is, this is a question I haven't heard an answer for yet, and I'm hoping you can answer it for me. So if we're to go back to redefining racism, right, if we are to accept the definition, the new redefinition of racism being what we used to call systemic racism, so this whole prejudice plus power definition, the way that that gets watered down when it reaches the masses is that it's it's therefore impossible to be racist towards white people. And the same thing with sexism, they say it's impossible to be sexist towards men. So if we're teaching people that essentially it's impossible to be racist towards one race or sexist towards one sex, at what practical, at what measurable end goal will we just suddenly decide, hey, now it's possible to be racist towards white people again, or hey, now it's possible to be sexist towards men, and then how do we how do we teach these generations of children that we've taught? <laughs> it's such a good question. Yeah. How do we get there? It's it's how, do we, how do we get what these guys want to go to and stop hearing about it? It's that? easily one of the most boring topics that ever comes up. I think that, and this is why I, I think that if you're a lefty or liberal, whatever you want to call yourself, neo progressive, I don't know. Uh, just to see the definitions. Um, I think that there is an interesting conversation to be had about how groups of people can exert power over other groups of people. I am incredibly and intensely bored over how we use the word racism. I think that most of us would agree that there's a difference between a group of people enacting racism against another group of people. I think everybody would agree with that, unless you're delusional. And I think we all agree that on an individual level, all of us can exert some level of racism. Even the most hard, well, maybe not the most hardcore, but like 95% of people in the political spectrum would agree that black people people or Hispanic people can be racist towards white people. But you would have to be crazy to think that black people as a group or Hispanic people as a group can enact any kind of meaningful harm on white people as a group when we hold like all of the major what dominant positions. But that's not the what point of our question. Like, like, what am, what is, like murder rates, for, for, for goodness sake. I mean, look, look at the cr black criminality is complete disproof of this silly statement. And, but and black I, criminality I also, doesn't affect most people. There's also, like 10 cities in the US where black I, criminality has any impact on and some people. I also just can't right. accept this thing like, oh, I'm so bored of hearing about that. We just had our entire country ripped apart on this exact question, right. on this precise question. The, the left is trying to redefine the most important word in America's history, which is racism. America is, 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 is unintelligible without an understanding of, 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 uh, of, of uh, racial uh, politics. And racism, and what we think of each other, is the central animating concern of the entire American project. America is a creation of black and white, and they have never existed in, in, in the harmony that they should thanks to one original sin, and thanks later to malevolence from Democrats, ignorance and stupidity from Republicans. Now there are other things coming into the mix with new kinds of immigration. Racism is, is, is you, you, I, I know that you're saying that you're bored of the definitions game, but you can't afford to be, because the central animating question of the next 10, 20 years is gonna be, do we accept this new version of racism, which paints white people as the eternal um, oppressors, as I, white I people become a minority At least the oppressors in, in our country. lifetime, and which, and which, as a result of the Democrat Party's embrace of Black Lives Matter, will inevitably, if they get a president in the, in, in the office, and you, you always, with, I, must, I must just be stern with you just this once, you're always talking about how you want to bring back policy, laws, who's passing this stuff, Congress. Well, the Democrat Party has embraced Black Lives Matter, which means that the, the Democrat Party has embraced this new definition of the most important word in American history. And if they get a president in November, they will t attempt and probably succeed to pass laws based on that new definition. So I just think it's absurdly stupid and lazy, and, and, and I'm sorry, it's just unacceptable to say, I'm sorry, I'm just bored about this linguistics discussion. I mean, if we were to come on, yeah, sure. I mean, oh, you don't 
never get to be bored by it. I, I, the, the boring part is that, like, if I have a conversation with a conservative on this, I already know that saying, like, prejudice plus power is going to trigger the ever-living fuck out of them and we can't ever... So I'll just say, like, yeah, I'm talking about systemic racism, is what I'll say. And then let's have a conversation about systemic racism, not should racism be defined as the same or different thing from systemic racism. And the idea that, like, future policy is going to be written based on the redefining of these words, I mean, we already have protected classes. They don't exclude white people, even if they seem to on Twitter. If you, ho if you have a building and you're renting to a family and you say no whites allowed, or you say no men allowed, you're going to be held up at the same uh, federal housing standards that you would under any other platform. Uh, the, the idea that like this, this obsession over how we define a word, it's like the most first world problem ever. When, again, when I have a conversation with a conservative, if you want to say that, well, racism is just any time you prejudice somebody against uh, against somebody based on their skin color, yeah, that's fine, that's okay. Then let's just talk about systemic or structural racism. Think it's the most, okay. I don't think it's the most first, first world problem in the world. I think the way in which we're speaking about it is a, a privileged debate stage way of talking about something that the entire country is living. And the problem itself, where we have discussions with it based on you know linguistics, which we or, or, or definitions that we hope get us to the truth and hope get us to understand each other's positions. But the, the rest of the country is living this stuff. But this it's is not an abstract this, first this is world the whole point, though. consideration. They don't live the the types of racism that we talk about. We how much racism did we talk about up here that it, had to do with getting banned off of Twitter? My entire, Wait, how, how much did we talk about? Okay, the guys, we're nowhere near resolution. We're out of time. We're out of time. Talking about Floyd and structural racism. My entire family is out of time. Stephen, we're out of time. Steven, I need you to take your mask off. You two kiss. <laughs> and we're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. No, thank you guys so much. I think that was, uh, I think that was a really productive and uh, good conversation. Very I, I, I did not envy Brandon and his job uh, walking into this, trying to keep the two of us up the job, yeah. given our respective reputations. And it turned out that only I was the thank problem. So, uh, Brandon Strick, thank you very much. <laughs>